So today's talk is about building a streaming analytics pipeline with Kafka and Druid. So it has a few interesting things here that will have to be defined. What is in a, uh, what the heck is a streaming analytics pipeline? What Kafka is probably many here know already. Druid probably somewhat less. So who knows? Who knows Kafka? Or has been working with Kafka? Oh yeah, a lot. Who knows Druid? Well, quite some. Well, that's nice. Okay, great. So um, my name is Helmar. I'm a developer advocate with a company called Imply. Uh, Imply was co-founded by the creators of Apache Druid. Um, the company is headquartered in the US. Myself, I live near Munich with my family. I blog more or less regularly, mostly about Druid. The um, QR code here on the presentation takes you directly to my blog. Uh, happy if, if you read it and if you like it. So what I'm going to talk about today is, well, first of all, what is this whole streaming analytics thing all about? Why, why do people do it? Um, what did we do before? And how and why did it change? And then I'm looking at the different components that you're going to need in order to set up a streaming analytics pipeline. Uh, so that would be streaming ETL, the analytics proper. I'm going to cover the type of database that you need for that and how and why Druid is an uh, prime example for that. And <clears throat> with all these building blocks in place, I'm going to present to you an architecture or an architecture template, if you will, for building a, a streaming analytics uh, architecture, a streaming analytics pipeline. And I'm going to show that to you in a live demo that hopefully uh, works in just a few minutes. I'm going to start my timer so that I, I'm not running over time. So, and I hope we'll have a few minutes after that for, for questions um, that I hope I can answer. So, yeah. The case for streaming analytics, how did we do analytics 20 years ago? You know, first of all, or even farther back, there were databases. Somebody came up with relational databases back in the 80s, I believe. And it was a great thing to be able to just throw all your data, your transactions, your interactions into a database and doing whatever queries on top of that. Very soon, people noticed that what you want to do there is in order to get your transactions processed quickly and scalably, uh, you need to build a specific kind of schema. You need to normalize your data so that every item ex exists, if possible, only once in the database. And that, in turn, makes it difficult to run analytics because if you run analytics, if you want to know how many pizzas have I sold during the last three months and how do I break them down by flavor and by outlet, um, then you need to query a lot of these tables that have each, each of them has a little bit of the data and then that's going to be difficult. So what happened was uh, we started uh, devising a, a second type of database that was optimized for analytics where data is in a more denormalized form, star schema comes to mind, uh, or possibly even pre-aggregated. So then we are with data marks. And in order to ship data from the transactional systems to the analytical systems, a process called ETL was devised. And back, back in the day, these ETL processes would usually run uh, in batch mode. So uh, you would run them once, once a day or once a week or once a month, what have you. And um, then <clears throat> in the end, the data would be aggregated in the analytical database or OLAP database, and then the users would get their data, possibly one month after it happened. Well, yeah, but the world changed. First of all... <clears throat> Big data came second. Uh, the circle of of consumers that were could be considered analytical users widened because back in the day, back in, like in the early two thousands, analytical users were analysts that were paid for doing analytics. Nowadays, uh, if you go to your mobile phone and you open your banking app, you check your own, your account balance and your account history. In that moment, you are an analytics user. And you want to see what is on your bank account right now and not how it was one month ago. So you need to have everything in more real time. Um, well, yeah, so somewhere around 2010, uh, big data systems came up. Hadoop came up, if somebody remembers Hadoop. Um, I think it's still somewhere around. Cloudera still builds um, systems based on Hadoop. Um, Hadoop also had real-time components. 
Yeah, so back then, uh, HBase came up as a real-time database. There was Kafka, there was Flume. Some components that are today largely forgotten, although Kafka lives and thrives, which is great. And uh, the first concept to handle the idea of making data available really quickly and in real time was the Lambda architecture, where you said, um, I have a speed layer that gives me some analytics really fast, and I have a second historical layer that churns through the data in its own time and gives me the full analytics. And then there is a common serving layer that reconciles these two paths and gives the analytical users the results. So sounds complicated, and it is. There's a complexity to it. It's kind of brittle. It's hard to maintain. It's hard to build. Um, and if you have two machines that process the same data and then you have to reconcile the result, uh, I'm always reminded of the ancient adage, a man uh, or a person with one watch knows always knows the time. A person with two watches is never sure. And that is the problem of this architecture. So next step, um, and that was actually suggested, I believe, by Jay Krabs, one of the co-founders of Kafka, was the Kappa architecture. In the Kappa architecture, you have only one processing engine. And that processing engine spits out analytical results as you go, but at the same time, also sends events to historical storage. Still somewhat complex if you have to build it yourself, but it's um, much more nimble, I should say, than uh, the, the Lambda architecture. Now, of course, it would be really nice if you could encapsulate that so that you just get data in, data out, and you don't really have to bother yourself with all the complicated detail in between. And we'll come to that in a moment. But first of all, I have to look at the ETL process, the process of shipping transactional data into the analytics database again once more. Because now that we are looking at events, if we want to do everything in ETL, uh, everything in real time, uh, the ETL process also has to be real time. It cannot handle big batches of data. It has to work on events. And what do you do? So you, you extract data that is usually done with a simple adapter. There is, uh, if you have databases that are your data source, then you have a process called change data capture, which is another story for another time. Um, I'm today going to focus a little bit on the transform part because there's a lot of things that you want to do um, with your event data as it comes through. Uh, and these lots of things that you want to do, they are basically grouped into two big parts. Number one is what we call simple event processing, which means you look at one event at a time. You do things to that event. You might want to filter events, like throw away some events because of some reasons. You might want to transform them. Uh, you want to cleanse the data. Uh, so anything that you can do only with, with one event only looking at itself. That is simply event processing. And there are a lot of good tools for that. Apache NiFi is one of them. I love NiFi, by the way. Um, the more interesting part is complex event processing, where you look at events as they relate, relate to each other. For instance, you do win windowing. So you look like always certain amount back in time, and you do an aggregation over the time window. You do any kind of flexible aggregations. Well, going back to the account balance example, if, you, if I want to have my, my, my sum of transactions for every month, how much have I spent? That would be an, uh, such an aggregation. Joints of streams, think orders and ship, shipments. And uh, finally, data enrichment, like you have transactions, then you have the addresses of people, and as they change, uh, you want to uh, put the addresses of data you want to tack them onto each event, and that would be your, your modeling of slowly changing dimensions. Um, I'm looking at, going to look at a very basic level at uh, complex event processing today, and I'm going to use KSQL DB. KSQL DB is a tool that is developed by Confluent, but it is, uh, it, uh, it is available under a community license, so anybody can use it for free. And uh, it is a tool to write SQL in order to create stream processor applications. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. You write SQL queries. These SQL queries are persistent. That means you once you, you, you kind of 
deploy it, if you will. You, you send the SQL query and then it will continue to produce new output data as new input data comes in. So we have looked at the uh, events. So, uh, I've, I've always kind of, you know, um, assumed that, yes, the mainstream delivery ser service is Kafka. We have the stream processing, which is SQL DB. And we are going to have an analytical data store database. And that is going to be at Apache Druid. Why is Apache Druid cool? Apache Druid has, uh, well, it is an analytics optimized database. It works in real time. It can give you sub-second query results at any scale. It scales linearly with the, with the data. Uh, it is built for high concurrency, which sets the part from some other blazing fast analytical data stores. And, and that ties back to the Kappa architecture story that, I've, that, that I told before. It encapsulates a Kappa architecture. So it, it, a query that you put into Druid spans historical and real-time data at the same time. And all that with built-in uh, service discovery, built-in disaster, uh, uh, disaster recovery, and uh, <clears throat> with uh, enormous scaling ability. So how does it do that? Well, if you look at this, this is a very, very coarse um, overview of the architecture of Druid. Um, typically, you deploy a Druid system. It's a distributed system. You deploy it on three kinds of servers. We've got master servers that you see to the right here on this picture. The master servers, they have processes that know about the cluster state. They know which data is where. They know which, which processes are where. They handle service discovery, restarting of services, and all these things. And we've got query servers. The query servers are the ones that clients talk to, and they send queries to them. Query servers can scale. So if you need more because you need more concurrency, you just add more query servers. And finally, the workhorses are data servers. Data servers handle two important things. Number one, it, they handle queries. Number two, they handle ingestion. So there is a process called the historical process, which, as the name suggests, handles historical data that already live on these servers. Then there are indexers, and indexers ingest data in real time from Kafka. You can have as many in indexers on a Kafka topic as you can have, as, as you have partitions in that topic. And that is a limitation of Kafka architecture. It's not a limitation of Druid. Indexers build so-called segments, which are chunks in time. And once such a segment is ready, is full, if you will, because its time period is over, then the segment is transformed into an optimized form, sent to an archive called deep storage, and then brought back to the historical process. Queries that are sent by the broker, the broker chops up the queries into partial queries, each of which can be handled by a single data server alone. It's a scatter and gather method methodology. And the broker also knows which segments live on the historical servers because they have already been finalized and which servers live on the indexes because they are still being built. And the broker transparently uh, gets the query results from all these components, and you never ever bother about it. So it's, it's actually a pretty cool architecture. There's a lot more to tell about this. I could go on all evening, but we need to continue. So now we've got all the components. We've got Kafka, we've got KSQL for, for the pre-processing, and we've got Druid for the analytical queries. You may also notice that both the case SQL DB and also Druid do SQL, although they do it in a different way. A SQL DB does what, what I call push queries. So once you send the query to the case SQL DB server, then it continues to emit results for a specific query, and it's, it builds a new Kafka topic for that. Druid is built to handle pull queries for a snapshot in time and uh, any kind of query um, that you can conceive, it is built to do on-the-fly aggregations, on-the-fly analytics on detailed data. So what am I going to look at today? I have a, I'm going to look at a very, very simplified uh, example. <clears throat> um, my example is going to be based on clickstream data, but actually it's, it's, it's fake clickstream data. So I'm imagining I am a news publisher. So I'm running an, an online newspaper and I'm collecting all the user interactions. <clears throat> and um, I have various types of, of records 
in my data stream, um, which is something that can happen with certain Kafka architectures. So the first thing is I need to be able to, um, to, to separate these different types of events apart. So I need to um, handle my data as a kind of seamless structured event this first in order to ensure that I keep only those data that conform to a very specific schema. In the second step, I'm going to apply some basic filtering on the data, looking at the data in a structured way. And then I'm going to ingest those data into Druid. And I'm going to show to you, well, I'm going to, not going to build the entire thing this year as a dashboard that you would build on this type of clickstream data, which shows you exactly user interactions over time, conversions, all these things. This is what you can then build. Um, this is the only point where I'm going to use a commercial component, which is the front end that Imply builds on top of Druid. But you can, of course, build use any front end, and you can even use other database applications at this point. So here's the architecture. I'm going to have data generated. Then I'm going to, to deliver the data with Kafka preprocess with KSQL DB, and then I'm going to put the data into Druid. So let's pray to the demo gods. And so what I'm going to, what I, what I have here is, and I can show that here very quickly. So this is what my data looks like. There's a, uh, a Kafka topic. It's called Imply News. All this stuff runs on my local laptop right now. And actually, if you want to rebuild the demo, you can run it on a laptop. And like I said, it's all free. Um, and what you may notice here is I've got one record type, which is called click. You can see that here. And that is, these are the ones that I want to keep. And I've also got pre-aggregations from some other processing layer here, which is record type session that has a different schema. I want to throw them away. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. Wait a moment. So is that better? Yeah. So um, here we see. So here I have got record type click. This is most of, the, of my data. And then I've got record type session. And the session is going to be in a, a, a pre-built aggregation that I'm not going to look at. Um, <clears throat> so this goes now, is, uh, I can run it live. Then you see the data is being produced, actually being produced by a small Python script. Um, now I'm going to put this into KSQL DB. KSQL DB has a command line interface. It also has the REST API. Um, I'm now going to use the command line interface. And the first thing that I'm going to do is um, KSQL DB has an abstraction on top of the Kafka topic, which is called a stream. Uh, so there are streams and tables. Again, this is a story for another time. Uh, what I do here is, is this big enough to read? I zoom in a bit. Huh? So um, I'm, I'm going to create a stream with value format Kafka, which means I interpret my data as just binary data. And it's just this create stream statement that I'm going to copy and I'm going to put it into my KSQL DB. And it says stream created. So I haven't really created any, anything materialized. I've just put a logical structure on top of my existing Kafka topic. And I can do things like show streams. I can query the stream already. Well, but let's just continue from here. Next step is then, um, I'm going to send another create stream command, which is here. And what I'm going to do now is, this is where I split off the data. So I'm interpreting those data as just a blob of bytes. So if I want to extract that record type field, I have to use an extract JSON function, and I'm going to do that. So I say create stream as select, and I apply that filter. And this step, it's, it looks very similar, but it actually creates a new topic. The topic, to, topic here has the name imply news clicks. So it's a create as select. And as I send that command to KSQL,
it takes a small moment, run it, and then it says created query. And now I can do show topics. And there is a double O. So now the topic in plan use clicks came into existence. Now the next step is I'm still on the on the level of unstructured data. The next step is to reinterpret these data as structured. So let's do that. That will be another create stream command. And here I apply my, my schema. Let me see if I can capture this all with a, with a, with a copy. I need to make this smaller. So now I supply, I apply my, 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 the knowledge of all the fields that I have in my click records. I, So, and with that, I interpret the data in my stream as JSON. I can do things now like select star from apply news cooked. That should work. And there it's, it sends me the data. So, and you can see it has now captured the schema. And then the next step and the last step is with that, I can do my regular cleansing process. So let's say I want to get only the users that come from Germany. And for that, I'm again creating a new stream. So here, I say create stream as select star from implant news cooked where country code is DE. And that creates another new topic. So, and that is my analytics pipeline, or my, my, my pre processing pipeline. Now I have got a new topic, which is called implant news DE, which has only the records that I'm interested in. And the last step is to get these data into Druid, but that is also very simple. This is the Druid console. This is what the data engineer works with in Druid. And um, maybe I should again zoom in a bit. And uh, here is a load data wizard where I can say I want to have streaming data that I ingest and I want to load these data from Kafka. My bootstrap server for Kafka in this case is localhost. Port 1992. And my topic is the one that I just created. Imply news DE. So now it's reading the data. Now it's reading data from the stream and it's sampling those data for me. Um, it will take a moment, but no, it shouldn't, shouldn't take too long. And then I can go through my wizard and model my data. Actually, very simple. Number one is um, parsing the data. Well, this is JSON, so this is easily parsed natively. There we go. The next step is in Druid, you always have a timestamp because data is organized by time. So I need to pick a timestamp. But actually, conveniently, you may notice there is a field that's called timestamp, and this will be picked automatically. So it has picked and parsed the timestamp and the rest. Well, I can do some transformations and changes here. I'm not going to do that. So I'm just clicking through here. I need to define the time chunks that I, I mentioned before. So let's make this daily. And I want to start, read from the start of my Kafka stream. And that's it. So now I hit submit, and that was my database ingestion part of the analytics pipeline. So let's wait until this starts out. It, will, it takes a couple of seconds to start, and then we'll see what we can do with the data. So let's see if it has already a task. It has. 
Okay. And then I can probably already see, no, not quite yet. There it is. So here, here's, here's data coming in. And the next step is, now I'm going to go to the front end. So this is a front end that Imply built, but you could also use anything that speaks JDBC. Uh, you could use your own application. Uh, what I'm going to do here is just to give you an idea how to, how to go on building the application. Uh, you create a new data cube, so that is basically just the metadata layer to interpret what you have in Druid. And I'm going to pick Imply News DE as the data source, create the data cube. It will pick the dimensions and measures for me. For measures, it doesn't have so many right now, and actually most of them I can throw away. But um, so here I'm counting events, but I can also do things and let's just do that. Like I have a session ID here. If I want to uh, count the unique sessions that I've had in my data, I can just say aggregation, not sum, but unique values of session ID. And at this one, or I should also give it a nice name. And like the, just like that, I can define my own measures here in simple SQL formulas. So, and there I am. And now I can drag and drop my, 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 my dimensions and my measures. I can show how data came in in the latest hour. So, let's just look at this here. And it updates in real time. So, every time I hit update, I get new data. I can also pull in some more measures. For instance, if I want to know not only the number of events, but also the unique sessions, and I can even overlay them to, with each other. So these are a few things that you can do here. So how long does it take now? 10 minutes. So I hope I kept my promise with, of, of building an analytic pipeline in minutes. So what have we seen? Um, uh, so we've seen how I built based out of one data source. I built an entirely uh, entire uh, analytics pipeline with event delivery, event pro pre-processing, uh, pre and putting data in an analytical data store. Uh, adding a front end that. Uh, Send, uh, it emits analytical queries and visualizes the data for you. And uh, just like that, many modern use cases actually are built on this kind of, of architecture or on similar architectures. So just with Kafka and Druid, just with uh, open source components, you can build a powerful analyt streaming analytics architecture. <clears throat> with KSQL DB, uh, you can enable streaming ETL using pretty much standard SQL well, or a dialect of SQL. Um, with Druid, you, you enable analytical queries on streaming data, on the details, on every snapshot. So the main difference here is, again, with KSQL DB, you can do custom aggregations, but every aggregation that you run continuously, and that is how you run things in KSQL DB, for every aggregation, you also create a new Kafka topic. And uh, that is sometimes it makes a lot of sense. If you, if you have a spe specific microservice based delivery architecture, or if you need a specific aggregation all the time, then you use KSQL DB for pre processing, for streaming ETL. That's great. If you want to have flexible analytics, ad hoc analytics, where, I, where, where you say, oh, now I want to apply a different kind of filter. I want to drill down by this dimension and then by another one. Then you need the flexibility that you can always go down to the utmost level of detail. And that is where a database like Druid shines. And together, it's a really powerful combination. So if you, if you can take that with you from today, then I hit my target. Thank you. All right. 
All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So I'm Stefan. Yes, take your laptop, maybe. You good? Thank you. All right, so I'm Stefan. I work at Vault. Uh, today, I'm talking with two other people. They will introduce themselves later. And tonight, I'm going to be here to talk about how Vault is using machine learning uh, for logistics topic. Uh, and on my side, I work on the machine learning platform. So I'll focus on the machine learning platform, then talk about logistics. That's the plan for tonight. So yeah, quick content, quick intro about Vault. Maybe you don't know us. Uh, so it's going to be sales speech for two minutes. Then it's what you're interested in. Uh, so Vault started in 2014 in Finland, where now in 25 countries, 500 plus cities, 29 million clients, I think now. A lot of people, a lot of restaurants, a lot of core partners. So there's a stats. You're not really here for that. We go from Iceland to Japan. So that's it. I have one more. Yes. Sorry, the clicker is laggy. There you go. We have different product teams because we have one app technically for you, but we also have apps for merchants. We have app for queries. We have B2B. We have Vault Market, which are supermarkets. We have a lot of different product teams. And usually if you work as an engineer, you're going to be in one of those product teams. Then we have five tech hubs, uh, Helsinki, Stockholm, Berlin, Tel Aviv, and Tokyo. And that was it for the sales pitch. I'm done. Now we can do a tour of the machine learning platform. All right. So I'm at Vault. Uh, we have different use cases. Uh, and we have like supply and demand forecasting, which is, okay, next week, how many people are going to order? How many query partners do we need in the street? Um, so that's what we forecast. We have recommender systems. Let's say you want, you move to a new city. We're going to be like, okay, like which restaurant we may like. Um, you order a lot on IKEA, for example. Maybe which, which thing you may uh, want to order next. Logistic. I won't spoil the content, so that we'll talk about it. Uh, we have fraud detection, and we have support prioritization, and then we have new use cases coming later during the year. So I can't talk about them. So we have different use cases, which mean different needs. Uh, our data scientists, they obviously need access to data. You want them to access production data, but you don't want them to access everything in production. So it's also like, how do you do it to make it simple and yet safe to have access to production data? Also infra access, you know, like now everyone needs GPUs for like the past months because everyone is like doing LLMs. So those things So like, how do you get access to GPUs? How do you make it easy for them to access to GPUs? How do you make sure they have enough CPUs when they train their models, enough memory? But you want that to be easy. So that's another thing. You want them to deploy quickly. You know, you don't want them to struggle to deploy something. It has to be easy so they can have like more impact. I don't have to struggle to be like, okay, how should I deploy that? Oh, I don't really want to deploy. It's really nice in my notebook over there. I want it to stay there and never go to production. So you don't want that. So like, how can you make that to be fast and easy? And then monitoring, uh, which is the last part. You want to track everything. You want to make sure that your model is good. You want to make sure that also the performances are good. Let's say the latency and different monitoring. And you don't want the data scientists to, to write the same code every time. Because first, most of them don't really care. Uh, so you have to do it automatically. Uh, because it's not part of their job. So then like, how do you do that automatically? How do you make sure that it works for every model? So that's, those were the needs we had. And quick intro as well for people that don't know about ML lifecycle. It's always the same. So you have like the research and development part. So you have, you know, you formulate a problem, you get some data, you do some ML a bit, you play around, then you have your models, and then you evaluate them. You make sure that you're happy or not. Um, and then, once you're happy with one, you go to production. You deploy your model, you monitor it, you evaluate it, and you go back to research and development and you iterate. And that's really like the entire thing we want, is to iterate quickly uh, and make sure that ML, we can solve all the challenges we had before, because we had a lot. Uh, so yeah, like there was one challenge, uh, which is like, we only had a couple of projects that, that existed, and for the new project, it was also very hard to launch them um, because you were like, yeah, I don't want to deploy the project or I don't know how to access GPUs, all those things. We had a lot of different tools. We had Airflow, CronJob, SageMakers, custom code running on our clusters. It was not pretty 
And then the impact was also not always known because you couldn't monitor everything. So he was like, okay, like I have my model. Is it working? I don't know. It's working well. I have no idea, but we have a model running. So it was hard to measure everything. So those were the challenges. And we're like, okay, let's focus on one thing, make iteration very quick and very easy. My screen's black. It's back. All right. So yeah, so what did we want for the ML platform? Uh, first thing, product thinking, as I said, launch new project easily, iterate easily. Driving force for new projects. You don't want the ML platform to be a blocker for new projects. And make sure that data scientists can do things quickly and they have like a lot of velocity. Yeah. All right. A lot of toolings as well. You avoid having them to write boilerplate code. There's always the same. Uh, have common best practices as well. Like how do you write tests? What should you test? Uh, have templates as well they can use so they don't have to like define the same code all over again. And a lot of automation, a lot of CI CD. So they don't have to do it. And then they can just deploy automatically without having to think about how to do CI CD actually, how to write GitHub actions and those things. And the impact of monitoring everywhere by default, log everything by default. Um, and then I think we'll talk about that later. And at first, we had Airflow. It was like two and a half years ago now. And it was good, it was nice, we're happy. Uh, but at one point, we're not happy uh, because they don't support dynamic tasks. Uh, they didn't actually in 2022. Um, so it means that you couldn't generate tasks at runtime. So you couldn't be like, oh, how many tasks should I have? I don't know. Let me check my database. How many cities do we have in the world? And then you create tasks for all the cities you have. So you couldn't do that before. Now you can. Uh, you have to explicitly uh, define the task dependencies, which can be annoying. Like you have task A that, is, that has to run. You know, before task B, you have to define it explicitly, which is not the best. And then you have no caching. So it means that you transform your data. And let's say you're going to train a new model with the exact same data. You have to rerun everything again, which, uh, which is not optimal. And then it's also not really designed for ML. So that was a bit of a pain. And then we went with uh, something else, which is open source, which is called Flight. Uh, it's, it was developed by Lyft in the US, and now uh, it's fully open source. Um, and what's good is that it's Kubernetes native, so our whole infrastructure is running on Kubernetes. Um, and then it supports automatic prioritization. So let's say you have two tasks running. You have task A, it doesn't need anything from task, uh, task B running. You don't need anything from task A. It's going to run everything in parallel. You don't have to define everything. Like It does it for you. It has uh, version, uh, reproducible pipelines as well. It has caching. That's probably one of the best thing. So if you train a new model on the same data, you don't need to like, transform it again. Um, or if something crashes and you know, like you take six hours to train your model and it crashes after four hours, then the first four hours will be cached. So you don't have to do it again. And you're not losing that time again. And it has different SDKs and it has dynamic workflows, uh, which is also really nice. We use it uh, to train our model per city or per country. We have like more than 500 cities now. And imagine, you don't want to change the code every time we add a new city because we add cities every week, basically. Um, so you just go like over the list of the cities. And then if you have 500, then it's going to create 500 workflows for you. And you don't have to think about that. So, so yeah, that's why we use Flight. Uh, we've been using it for a year now. I think people are happy, but I don't know. Uh, and then the whole ML platform, so the, the entire ML platform is open source. And that's what we have. So a flight, I mean, flow to experiment tracking, a fancy database with a UI, basically. Then we'll have Python. And the last one is Selden Core, which is what we use to deploy our model super production. And it creates uh, nice microservices, automatic logging. You have A-B testing, you can do canary deployment. Yeah, it's like, it is nice. So yeah, that's the whole ML platform we have. And that's what our data scientists are using. And now the mic is yours. Thank you. Can I take the clicker? Yes. And yeah. Perfect. So now we, oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Gus. So I work uh, as a data scientist in the logistics team. And uh, so I'm going to talk about like how do we utilize these tools that were just represented here? Okay. Um, cool. 
same sales slides that Stefan showed. Um, I'm going to speak about a little bit in terms of like, what does this mean? We in the eyes of a data scientist. So if you look at that, you can see that the scale is pretty big. So you, you can imagine that this like data, the context is, is pretty heterogeneous. And um, this, you know, creates you a lot of potential for ML and data science solutions. So one task that us in logistics uh, are responsible for is providing customers with delivery time estimates before they place an order. And just in terms of like looking, looking at this, you can pretty much imagine that it's pretty different, you know, operating in Iceland versus operating in Japan. So just think about like what the cities are like. Um, you know, some cities are more densely populated. Some cities are more sparsely populated. Some areas are big and, you know, deliveries take a long time because of, you know, longer distances. Some cities have better infrastructure for, you know, using certain vehicle types. And yeah, so this is just in terms of like, how is it to, to actually deliver stuff? But then if you consider the merchant side, we have a lot of merchants, like over 100,000. And these can also be of, you know, broad variety. Uh, they can be either, you know, restaurants, they can be retail stores, they can be pharmacies, they can be, you know, franchise businesses, small local businesses, they can, um, yeah. So even with this categorization, they can have very different kind of traffic in terms of purchase volume. So this really creates you a lot of opportunities in terms of, you know, what you can do with this kind of context in the data. Also brings a lot of challenges because of the availability and quality of data. Because you can't just, you know, assume that uh, you have lots of data from a certain venue that, oh, let me just compute aggregates. But what if the venue has very little data? You know, they have a single purchase per day. What kind of aggregates are you going to compute then? But uh, so, yeah, let's come back to the point where we have this use case of uh, providing customers with delivery time estimates. So it probably comes as no surprise that, you know, we have a machine learning model that estimates these um, delivery times. But let's, for the sake of a good story, let's just assume that, you know, we're only now going to build that product. So, or that, that feature to our product. So someone comes up and, hey, we scoped up this problem. We want to roll out this model um, that estimates the delivery time. And well, you enter your development cycle, you plan, you reiterate and, and yeah, repeat this until you're satisfied with the you know, model performance or you run out of time and, and you know, are forced to hand in the model. But uh, yeah, so you, you manage to develop a machine learning model locally. But then what still misses is, is that how do we then serve these estimates to our customers that you know, are browsing the app and want to see how long would it take if I went, was an, went to order from here? So how do we serve these estimates to our clients? Hi, um, I'm Anil from the logistics team and I'm a software engineer. And this is where basically our data scientists hand over their models to us. See how the clicker does. Yeah. So yeah. How do we? So let's imagine that we have a model that lives as an artifact in some remote storage. So how do we deploy this in Kubernetes? And how do we ensure that this is callable and returns predictions for delivery estimates? Well, deploying it to Kubernetes comes with many different challenges and uh, many different considerations, and this can be overwhelming to manage and to unify across many different apps. So we basically make use of a unified solution to make this more manageable. We use an open source tool called Celebin Core, which Stephen already introduced, uh, which our ML platform provides for us. Celebin Core takes care of most of the boilerplate in productionizing a machine learning service. Uh, a simple Python component for Celebin Core can easily look like this. Let's see if we have a clicker pointer. Seems the laser not really working. But uh, we can imagine that uh, we, we can have, with a simple code snippet, uh, we can load our model, define our custom uh, inference logic, and at the very end of it, call the predict method 
of our model. And then Selden will take care of wrapping this as a Flask and Unicorn-based microservice with a gRPC and REST interface. Selden is Kubernetes native and takes care of quite a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of managing Kubernetes resources. It provides a custom resource definition to help configure your deployment. What's also nice about Selden is that it's agnostic to the machine learning framework uh, that you're using. It provides uh, language wrappers for a big variety of languages and also supports monitoring and observability through request and response logging, tracing, and metrics. For example, it provides uh, custom Prometheus metrics, which, uh, for example, for CPU or memory utilization, throughput, latency, or errors, which enables you to build uh, Grafana dashboards to monitor your services. I, I mean, th this uh, dashboard is from some test data, so don't uh, think that the graphs will make any sense. Cool. Then to touch the flight part of it, uh, so we produced a model, machine learning model offline, and we were able to set up a microservice. Then what we probably would also want to have is like consistent performance over time. So how can we achieve that? We know that you know concept drift happens, and if you don't account for it, then the performance will degrade over time. So to account for it, we can just, you know, or one way to account for it is, is to uh, retrain your model periodically. Uh, and we do this by using flight. Um, what's really convenient in my eyes is, is that um, what happens is that each training leaves you a trace of, you know, the, the bars reflect the status. Uh, so you can see successes. And in case failures start occurring, you can also see failures. And even better is that you can also, like through Flight's UI, you get the visibility to logs. So you can more easily track the failures for like, why did my model training workflow all of a sudden start failing? So it might be happening, for example, you increased your memory size, but you forgot to increase your resources defined for the workflow, for example. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that was for production use, for you know, maintaining the model performance uh, as is in the production system. But it's also quite uh, handy in terms of, you know, enabling heavier research use. You know, local notebooks are okay for doing POCs and, you know, coming up with something. But then as soon as you want to actually start getting more systematic and finding out like, hey, I need to do like heavier hyper hyperparameter tuning or you want to explore with different like data selection strategies or, um, you know, just try different models, then obviously, you know, as you increase this, you know, search space, then, you know, you, you all of a sudden find yourself training the models for, you know, days, which on your local laptop is not maybe the optimal thing to do. So um, you can do this like heavier model trainings also through Flight's UI, which is pretty nice. You can, you know, just put some, I don't know if it's visible, but um, a prompt opens and you can specify inputs. You can obviously configure these, like what kind of things you want to input, but uh, lets you trigger things manually. And as Stefan mentioned, um, it supports caching. So you can pretty easily see, for example, like if you fetch data, uh, that fetching it once is okay, but fetching it every time is maybe not that nice. So the caching functionality really pay, plays a nice role here. And also one thing I'm, I'm gonna mention here is that executing workflows is actually bound to like commits, which, you know, with a fellow data scientist really facilitates the, the sort of uh, co-development of a project and a workflow even. So that's, I think, a really nice use case. But in any case, let's say that, you know, we go through all this, uh, continue development on the delivery estimate model, and um, we come up with some improvement that we'd like to then take to production. So we have the existing production model, and then we have this new candidate that we'd like to roll out. Then how do we go about? Yeah, so thanks to Flight, now we have a systematic way of uh, iterating, and we, based on the iterations, came up with a nice candidate model to replace our potentially replace our new model. 
And so how do we evaluate whether this new model is actually fit to run in production? Well, first, we want to expose this model to production traffic. But then how do we do that without actually impacting the uh, production service that is actually live at the moment? Well, uh, we can use shadow deployments. So Selden enables to define a second predictor and to basically flag it as a shadow deployment. What this will do is that all the requests that reach our main model will also be uh, reaching our shadow model, but all the responses will be uh, discarded. However, Selden still enables to log them. So with this setup, we basically have the possibility to monitor our model, both uh, basically on the model side and also on the technical performance side. From the model performance, based on the logs of the responses, we can see if the predictions that we get are as we expected. And from the technical performance side, we can observe whether uh, the new model actually introduces any bottlenecks for example, in terms of latency, or for example, in terms of memory or CPU utilization. So let's say we ran our shadow model for a while, we gathered enough data, and we have an idea whether our model uh, is passing our evaluation. So we managed to get, let's say, a model that passes our evaluation. Well, what is next? Well, we want to know whether now this model actually makes sense in terms of the business, in terms of our business metrics. So, and how do we measure this? Well, um, at Vault, we have uh, quite a strong experimentation culture, and we also have our own experimentation platform, which enables us to uh, test features before fully rolling them out to our customers. I'm pretty sure uh, most of you have already heard about A-B testing, but essentially what we, what we mean by this is basically to introduce uh, one version of a feature to one group of users, uh, for example, as a control group, and introduce a different version of the same feature to a different set of users. This enables us to basically observe our candidate model in a controlled way in the production environment. So for the A-B experiments, we uh, use another feature that is provided by Selden, uh, which is a header-based routing. This is also enabled by the underlying API gateway that we uh, make we use together with Selden. Uh, so instead of in comparison to the shadow model, instead of deploying a second predictor in the same deployment, this time we deploy a separate uh, deployment, which we could, for example, call as a camera deployment. But we add uh, two important things. So basically we add two annotations. One is a reference to the main model that we already have in production. And the second one is an arbitrary uh, header. What this enables is that basically both our main model and our candidate model can be called from the same endpoint. However, the requests that have the header that we defined in these annotations will be, uh, will be directed to our candidate model. So with this facility, then we can distribute our traffic using our experimentation platform. For example, with 75% of traffic going to the current model and 25 to our candidate model. So once we uh, run our experiment and gather uh, enough, let's say, sample data, we then uh, have an idea whether basically our new model makes sense in terms of uh, business metrics. And well, in case it does, then it means it's time to celebrate because we have a new model that's ready to be in production. And well, in case it doesn't, well, you know the story, we go back to the beginning of our uh, machine learning cycle. Yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Um, we hope that this was an interesting presentation for you, and that we hope that we also uh, were able to spark a bit of interest in Vault for you. Um, so we have a quite variety of positions that we're hiring for at the moment. So if you're interested, uh, please feel free to uh, check our career website.
And yeah, thank you again so much for your attention. And we'll be glad to take your questions.